Meccano part number 416 wheel flange from the 1970s army multi kit set because we all need one hi folks and welcome back this is the fourth of the army multi kit builds and I'm rather enjoying these builds to date in fact at the time of writing this I've just built the light tank I managed to get the breech to operate correctly unlike the AA gun that had no range at all the half track build allows me to use the tracks for the first time and gives me a chance to have a think and a play with some ideas. I would like to do some builds that are based on better examples of tracked vehicles. And this build, because while it is a half track, is not based on any model at all. I understand the problem that Meccano had which is that of very limited parts, leading to only being able to design what can be built. And I think I can do better. Building based on an actual prototype by using a larger outfit. But that is what Frank Hornby was trying to achieve. This one build has done its very job. It's inspiring me to want to do more, to step off the road and take the path less seldom trod. In other words, think, design, build and drink tea. Or is that drink tea first? Always get mixed up with that order. The appeal of these multi kits is simple. It's all you need in one box. And we're a great entry into the hobby. The downside is that you can only build one model at a time. And if you want to play with them, you really need more than one kit. And in many ways, the cab is the weak point in this set of builds. Like the highway kit before and the super highway kit to come, the preformed cab is both a strength and a weakness at the same time, as it gives the builder an easy way out when it, when it comes to the model. This is not the first time Meccano made multi kits around a theme. Some 40 years earlier they had tried it, with the aeroplane, the car and the mechanised army constructor sets. All three ranges were shelved at the outbreak of World War II and never returned post-war. As technology had moved on so far, and designs that had been cutting edge pre-1939 were very much not so post-1945. But in the mechanised army set, there is the transport wagon, model number 6, and a rather nice half tract it makes, based on the French P107 model, I think. But what of the history of half tracks? When did they appear? And why were they phased out? The history of the half track is an interesting one, mainly because it's not what I think it should be. When I think of half tracks, my mind pictures Second World War vehicles, either the SDKFZ 250 or 251, the 9, known as the FAMO, meaning famous, or the 11 series, towing the FLAC 88. Along with that, there is the American M3 half tracks. But the half track is older than that. I know of the French inventions in the 1920s with the P-17. But were the French the first? Or were they building as something before? And the answer is both yes. Adolphe Crugress, a Frenchman born in 1879, is recognised as the inventor of the half track. Out of interest, he's also the pioneer behind the, the development of the small tracked remotely controlled guided bomb, the legacy of which has helped foil many a terrorist bomb. The first half track, as that is what it looks like, is an American invention, the Lombard Steam Log Hauler. The rear quarter of the vehicle has a continuous track and the steering at the front controls the vehicle's direction. The powerhouse behind this invention looks like an American Western steam engine. 
I suppose it makes sense, as you would be using what technology and designs were available at the time. The inventor, Alvin Orlando Lombard, was a blacksmith building logging equipment, and between 1901 and 1917 he built over 80 steam log haulers. The operation was controlled by a steersman at the front of the vehicle, stood where you would expect the cow catcher to be. He would control the direction of the engine by turning a large steer steering wheel that would in turn would move the large skis underneath. The best explanation of the vehicle is that it's a 30 or so ton monster snowmobile and I want one. Power to the tracks was direct from the valve gear of the engine through a gearbox. The log train could pull between three to eight sledges at five miles per hour, with the world record being 24 sledges coming in at around 500 metres or, or over 1,600 feet. The Berlin Mills Company, based in Stetson, Maine, estimated that their three log haulers could do the work of 60 horses. The main safety problem with the log haulers was on downhill stretches, where the weight of the timber could overpower the engine. At that point, the best action the crew could take, if the steersman could not control it, was to jump for their lives, and hope the jackknifing sledges behind didn't kill them. With the average train carrying up to 100,000 board feet of logs, it would have been some weight. Adolf Kugres converted a number of cars for Tsar Nicholas II of Russia as early as 1911 using his system of the Kriegress track. And this is where his designs differ from others. The Kriegress track is one continuous track, a bit like an oversized elastic band. Other designs use individual segments of track that are linked together. In both cases, tension is then applied to the track. And while tracked and half-tracked vehicles were used in the First World War, it was the Russians that were the first to convert their Austin armoured cars to be fitted with Kriegress tracks. In the revolution that followed, the Kriegress Austins were used by both the Red and White armies with somewhat limited success. Adolf Kriegress returned to France after the revolution happened, probably a wise decision given what took place. He went on to design the Citroen P17 half-track and the military version, the P107, which was designed to be the prime mover for the French 75mm and 150mm field guns of the French army before the invasion of the country in 1940. Over 3,000 had been built. We are led to believe that the German army was fully mechanised during World War II, and this is not the case. They relied heavily on horses, especially by the end of the war. But German half-tracks were of uncommonly great design, and were used long after the war by various countries that disappeared behind the Iron Curtain. All told, over 100,000 German half-tracks were produced throughout the war, compared to only around 50,000 US half-tracks. The half-track would continue post-World War II to see heavy use in many conflicts as ex-war surplus vehicles or new designs like the OT-810 that were built by the then Czechoslovakian company Tatra for the army. It was reported as being not well liked and was nicknamed as Hitler of a Pomster or Hitler's Revenge. As late as 2008, the Israeli army still had around 600 half-tracks on the officially active list, stating that in certain roles, mainly that of resupply, they are a better vehicle than either fully tracked or fully wheeled.
the main problem that exists with half tracks is that of maintenance. The average wheeled vehicle is good for around 80,000 kilometers before new tires are needed. But replacement tracks are needed at, needed at around 10,000 kilometers. That one link in the resupply chain creates a weakness and the humble lorry steps forward to fill that gap so easily. There is still one place where half tracks are still used and that's as glacier crawlers used in Iceland and the bright orange buses that look like a high-bred beetle that somebody has super glued skis and tracks onto and of course the Bombardier B12 snow bus. And while the half track is iconic of World War II, it began life some 40 years before and in military service carried on fighting for nearly another 20 years. Many were sold off to civilian service, with most being converted for heavy recovery in difficult areas. With an interesting picture of an M3 half track in use by Reno Steel Construction Limited on Cromer Beach in Norfolk 1993. I wonder what happened to that vehicle, as the company seems to have gone bust as of February 2022. From time to time a survivor gets rescued and restored, but they're getting fewer and fewer. And for most of us, the closest we'll get to one is either in a museum or, or by making a model kit. But both Alvin Lombard's and Adolphe Cressy's designs were inspirational and helped other designers create vehicles and played a large part in my childhood, helping to get glue everywhere and slopping paint around. But the idea of somebody bolting the working parts of a steam engine onto a tracked drive chain and having it steered by a man at the front is just wonderful. And if that's all I take from this, that's fine. You must have been terrified as you hurtled downhill with hundreds of ton tons of timber attached to you. The purpose of Meccano the drive behind Frank Hornby's creation was to get the mind turning. And I think he has achieved that for me. I've learned so much from this hobby. I made connections around the world doing so. But for me, the history behind the build, the prototype, is always a driving point. Because there are some wonderful stories to be told about things we have forgotten and people whose names are lost to history. <laughs>